All right. Welcome, welcome. Uh, all right, so uh, just so for those of you that don't know, my name is Scott Rogers. I am the director of events here at the New York Film Academy, but I am also a game instructor. So if you are ever a student here at New York Film Academy, you will be getting me, and I will teach you all types of cool things about making board games and video games and all types of other types of games. But we're tonight, uh, I'm not the star, it is this gentleman. Tonight's guest is a 30-year veteran of the game industry. He is a game designer, programmer, producer, musician, project director, and creative director at companies such as Electronic Arts, Crystal Dynamics, THQ, Amazon, and many, many more. Some of the titles he has helped create include the Medal of Honor series, the Madden series, Star Wars Episode Three, the Strike series, Strider 2014, and Blood Omen, The Legacy of Kane. He was the recipient of the 2019 IGDA Blacks in Gaming's Lifetime Achievement Award. Pretty awesome. Uh, please welcome our guest, a master of game design, Mr. Tony Barnes. <laughs> See, that one's so bad with it. Oh, wait, we're just getting started. All right, so as, as our regular uh, uh, attendees to the Masters of Game Design series know, I always start with an extremely hard question for you. Mm. And that question is, Tony Barnes, what is your favorite game? Uh, hmm. Like uh, any particular era? Or no, just... no, you pick whatever you like, man. It's all about you. Um, uh, it's, it's an old uh, platformer called Jumpman. Oh, yeah. Which a lot of people think is uh, Mario. Mario, but it's not. Okay. Uh, it's actually a Atari. Uh, <clears throat> so it was on the Atari uh, guy, Randy Glover. Um, no relation to Danny or any of the other Glovers. <laughs> but um, yeah, you're like this little stick figure. Um, you know, uh, very small, kind of like, uh, I think most people know Loat Runner. Mm -hmm. So yeah. imagine Loat Runner, but way more uh, robust in your in your kind of movement set. More jumpy. Even, yeah, even though you can just run and jump, like it has um, it has climbing, so you can climb up ropes and you can you get a ledge grab yeah. back in 1983, I think it was, or yeah. something that was made. And um, every single level is its own little gimmick. And uh, so I played that game on my Atari religiously, and uh, there's also a C64 version, mm -hmm. and I played it to death because it was just amazing. Like, every single level, you were like, oh, what's the next, what's the next gag on this? And this is in, you know, 1983, uh, pre-Mario. Yeah. So uh, that's probably one of my favorite games. Did you ever take any of the gags from that game and use them in your own? Oh, yeah. Yeah? <laughs> which, which, like, what's one I, game that you did that for? Um, hmm... Uh, yeah, probably, there, there's probably Jumpman gags in Buffy, yeah. um, even though Buffy is like, you know, 3D, a game. 3D combat brawler. Yeah. Honestly, like, you should be able to eyeball anything and then just kind of absorb it and then take it and use it yeah. uh, in whatever, so. Uh, I, I, I always say the creative process is like having a blender, right? You're like jamming as much stuff in there and then you turn it on and you pray what comes out is good. <laughs> if not, so, you just blend it some more until it becomes <laughs> Just blend it some more, get the chunks out, right? Yeah. Awesome. So um, you said you were playing games. I, 83, I assume you were younger back then when you were uh, 83. <laughs> so did you uh, make games when you were younger as well? Oh, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I, I started with, I guess, professionally. Um, my first paycheck was at 14. Oh. But I started when I was 12. Uh, Making games. Yeah. yeah, 11, 12, something like that. What were some of those games? Uh, so, you know, uh, basically like uh, Space Invaders clones, um, uh, Pac-Man clones, things like that. I mean, like, I was, you know, I'm sitting in school and I'm in uh, sixth grade and in, it's in San Francisco. So uh, it's, it's not terribly hard to be exposed to video games, um, even in the early 80s. Well, you were right in the epicenter, right? Like where Atari was starting and all that. So. Oh, yeah. So, um, you know, I'm sitting there in class and uh, they they cart in these computers, these, these Apple II computers, and nobody knew what the hell to do with them. <laughs> uh, at the time, uh, one of my teachers who... Uh, she was really big. It was uh, Miss Hill. Miss Hill, if you're out there, thank you very much. Thank you, Michelle. She um, she would let us run rampant. So we would do stop motion animation and stuff in, cool. in class and all this. 
And then in comes the computers, and she's like, I don't know what to do with it. And I said, I know, my grandma has one. My grandma didn't have one. <laughs> but, you know, uh, she was like, you know, just go ahead, do something with it. So, uh, you know, play some games, and everybody, everybody loved playing games, you know. As much as we loved Oregon Trail and everything, we loved, you know, the Tempest clones and Gorgon, which was a Defender clone and yeah, stuff like that a lot more. Yeah, so I would, I would draw stuff on paper anyway, and, you know, I would, I would DM, you know, as Dungeon Master and all that anyway. So I'm sitting here looking at this, at the computer and going, wait, I can move stuff. I don't have to deal with like moving it, you know, uh, yeah, so ever frame, slightly yeah. frame by frame, yeah. you know, trying to get 24 frames out of it and getting tired of doing that and then just, you know, making things jump across the screen. So I okay, I'm going to figure this out. And there was a guy, at, I don't know where he learned things because he was only a year older than us, but he walked up to uh, the Apple while I was sitting there playing a game. And he pressed the brake key, the almighty brake key, which I don't think kids nowadays what know is, what a brake key is. For, the, for these youngsters in the audience, <laughs> tell them what the brake key is for. Okay, so uh, on the keyboard, there's a key called the brake key. And what it would do is it would uh, stop whatever program was going on. And a lot of the programs back in the day were, you know, either uh, they were either uh, assembly language or they were basic. And luckily, the... Uh, the game that I was looking at, which was a very simple maze game, was basic. So um, I did eventually learn assembly. But he hit the brake key, and it all stopped. And I was like, well, what'd you do? And he said, um, yeah, you were talking about how you want to do something like this. Uh, so here you go. And he typed list, which would then vomit out the entire program that was running the, the game. And um, I watched all of these words fly by. And uh, it just made sense to me. So it was like I started changing things. It's like and the it, Matrix. Yeah. And <laughs> so I, I, you know, I saw blonde and brunette and all that flying by, and I just said, <laughs> okay. So I, um, I dove in that way. I just started like dissecting other people's games, and um, then eventually got books uh, because you know there was no, <laughs> there was no interweb, there was no Google. It was like, you know, you had to go to the library, the Dewey Decimal System. It was yeah. crazy. And uh, I got a book on basic programming. And then I got to the point it, where in sixth grade, uh, the start of the uh, class would start. And um, I would get through whatever the lesson was and have like a half an hour left over. So then I would sit down and the teacher would just let me sit at the computer and I'd make for the class something. I'd make cool. Space Invaders clone. Um, there was a type of game back in the day called Ski, uh, which nowadays I guess uh, you would call an endless runner. Mm -hmm. So it literally had like an H was U and like, you know, little carrots would go and you, you, you know, see how far you could go. I mean, it literally was like an endless runner minus the, the weight of monotonies. And um, I'd make stuff like that. And when I grew up, I was dirt poor. I mean, like poor, like I looked at poor people and said, oh man, it'd be so awesome to be like that. <laughs> but uh, so making these games, eventually, I actually got to the point where I could do them so fast and kind of do them on spec for kids in the class. So I would do that uh, for lunch money or whatever. And, um, so your first paying gig, yeah. Huh. And awesome. So that that's that's sixth grade, you know, making games on the Apple II. Nice. And um, you know, and then of course as a, a side thing, you would meet people uh, who were much better than you. You know, they know machine language and they know things like how to crack things. And that's how I met. Like <laughs> we would trade wares between us and code uh, and things like that. And then yeah. like yeah. So the thing is like when you're sitting there trying to learn how to crack something, you actually learn a lot about what's going on in the actual game. So uh, this is where, I, like, towards the end of, of sixth grade, uh, going into seventh grade, it's where I started transitioning out of basic and into assembly, mm -hmm. assembly language, and, or machine language as it was called back in the day. And part of that was just to want to, um, like I said, to you know, be part of the crew, making bouncy letters scroll by and all that stuff as, as uh, crack, 
you know, things that don't that people don't do anymore, or at least not that I know of. Well, but there's so many great tools now. It's oh, like, why do you need to go that close to the hardware unless yeah. you're doing something really crazy or really experimental, right? Yeah, you know, like it, it's interesting coming up through all all of these different phases. I always felt like. Um, I loved the constraints of whatever box, you know, I was working on because then you figure out how to break them. You yeah. figure out how to, to do something. You know, you always want to do something that made someone else go, holy, holy crap, you know, how'd they do that? <laughs> it feels a little less like that nowadays. It's more like holy crap on a, on a production level, you know, like right. someone looks at Last of Us 2 and goes, holy crap. You know, but that's like a that's an orgy of assets and that, that's a, that's a, you know, those people are operating at a, a different level. They're not sitting there going, okay, how am I going to make it so I can get more than five sprites on a line or something? Right. You know? right. Yeah. A lot of the major technical hurdles for us, you know, poly count and sprite count yeah. and level, like I remember where uh, on old SNES games I would work on, and they'd say, you only have three background levels to scroll, and that's it. And I'm like, oh, but if I only had one more, I could make it really cool. Nope, you don't have that, you know? Oh, yeah. But but I agree. I think the box is probably more important for us, right? It l does allow us to become more creative, um, and uh, and that's where you find the innovation. Now, yeah. do, you, do you not see that? Like, do you ever follow indie games, or do you ever? Oh, yeah. So, like, is there anything or anybody doing something like that in, in that realm for you? Do, you? do you feel that that exists just, I mean, it's probably just not existing on the AAA the level, passes. right? But there is actually a, a certain level of, of skill that clearly not everyone has, and so sure. they are flexing. It's just, it, it's just different. It, yeah, if you're looking for more of that kind of how did they do that, yeah, you, you tend to look towards the indies. Right. Um, or maybe even the fringe um, uh, technologies. I, know, and I, at fringe, I mean, VR is no longer fringe, right? But, <laughs> yeah. but it was for a while, and that, like, there were some neat things there. And GPS enabled things, and, you know, like Pokemon Go. And, oh, yeah. Know, I mean, that, you know, everybody was, how many of you guys were out there on the streets in 2016, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, probably like the rest of us, right? You know, trying to catch those little guys. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I, I think it still happens, right? Yeah. But it's just, it's harder to find, maybe? It's just the things have shifted because, I mean, our, our, our phones are a thousand times, probably even more than, than my first games were made. Oh, on, yeah. You know? yeah. And so you have a lot of headroom, um, which is funny also because I, I, I lurk in a lot of forums, by the way. You know, so if you guys are out there talking smack or if, you're, <laughs> or, or, or if you're throwing out love, I'm probably paying attention. Um, it's funny to me the um, things that people say, like they'll consider a 40,000 polygon character, you know, reasonable. I don't consider that reasonable. I don't even consider 20,000 low poly, but a lot of people do. But it's because... You know, they're coming up in an era where it's easier to, to fill that box and you're always like, well, you know what, by the time I'm done with this game, there'll be a bigger box, you right. know. Yeah. Um, when I started, it was, here's a city little box, make something that fits in it and, you know, hope, hope it doesn't break when you, when you send it out to someone. Right. Um, because you're not going to get a chance to fix it. No, you're not <laughs> going to get a chance to fix it. And that's a good and a bad thing, you yeah. know. Yeah. Um, I think it kept us honest. Yeah, I, I feel that way. I mean, like, when we talk about constraints and not being able to fix something, it reminds me of uh, Jungle Strike. So, you know, I worked on uh, the Strike series. Yeah. And uh, Jungle in particular was interesting because we were greenlit after Desert Strike. It was like, oh, wait, this is going to be a hit, which is funny because they didn't think it was going to be a hit. And um, They didn't think Desert or they didn't think Jungle? They didn't think Desert was going to oh, okay. be a hit. Um, it, which was originally called Beirut Breakout, and then they were like, okay, well, let's give it a name that we can latch on to. Okay, here's Desert Strike, so we'll call it that. They were like, well, you know, it's like the shooter. Shooters do like, you know, thirty to 50,000 units, and we don't know. It's not really in our Air Force. It's not really one of the arcade things. We don't know where to put it. It goes out, and... Um, I think within the first few, you know, the first like month or so, it it, it did sixty thousand units, and they were yeah. like, "Whoa, wait, it might be something." <laughs> to date, it's done. Well, last I checked, it was like ten million units. So they're like, "Oh, well, you should do another one." 
Um, so we just changed the background color of everything from, from orange to green, <laughs> just to say it's, and we literally called it New Strike for a while. It was in the same constraints as the original desert. We were using the same engine, which was relatively unheard of at that time. People, you know, would spit out a game and then go and spit out the next one, next one, all that. So we built upon what we had built already. And we were halfway through and we we're like, yeah, this is what it's going to be. And then they came back and said, everyone loves this game, the desert. And so we're going to give you twice as much space. You have to fill it up. So at first you're like, yay. And then you think, oh, I have to fill it up. So and, they you have a, and you have a year to do it. Uh, so. Yeah, and actually, uh, you get no more time. As yeah. a matter of fact, we're going to cut a month because you guys are working so hard and doing so great and everything. Right. Keep working that unpaid overtime. Yep. <laughs> Welcome to the game. It's interesting. Yeah. But uh, the interesting thing was not, okay, so they expanded the box, so we get more memory, right, on the cart, but no, no more time. But by the time we got through with it, because we were so enthused and into it and everything, we were probably two days away from having to go gold. And um, that's a cart. So cartridges have to be sent out to manufacturers. Um, so it's no working up to the day and then spitting out the game and watching the downloads and all that fun stuff that happens nowadays. No, it was work up to three months before the day that you said you were going to be out. And that's a drop dead because it has to go off to something that's out of your control, which is manufacturing. So we got our time cut, but we have to fill the box. We filled it and we overfilled it. So this is the, the, where you get crafty. I had done lots and lots of, of work on, on that game, um, you know, from design. And actually, every little enemy that you see is hand-coded and all this fun stuff. So that's all done in assembly. And um, we got to the point where we were actually, I think it was like 58 bytes over the cart limit. Oh, um, so close. And I could not figure out where to get it. It was like I, I was, I'm going through and I'm chopping up sentences. You know, that's where you end up with, you know, kind of the, the, all your base kind of talking is like, you know, <laughs> when you have to like bastardize text. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Start dropping pronouns, yeah. things like that. I'm yeah. taking every 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 8x8 eight eight tile I can. I'm figuring out how to reuse it. You're like, we stuff. don't need orange. <laughs> Let's just get rid of that. And we just... We just had no space whatsoever. And, and it was the morning before we were supposed to submit. It was easy to, you know, be at, at work at 8 in the morning when you didn't go home the, the day before. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I'm trying to figure out um, where we're going to get this 56 bytes and find out that uh, anyone that knows any old Electronic Arts games knows that when you pop in the cart and you turn on the Sega Genesis, uh, the, you know, the symbol would come flipping up at you and it's a square and a circle and a triangle. And that's, that was the EA's um, symbol. So it comes, it comes rotating up at you. I just assume, especially coming from my background of like, you know, demo coding and stuff, I assume that that was actually uh, an image being manipulated in real time, that someone was actually like, like, you know, scaling and rotating it because that's what I would have done. But come to find out, no, it was actually brute force, a bunch of uh, frames being held in the header, which is normally not touched by anyone. And I said, if we cut this out, we have more than enough space. And it had to go all the way up the, the food chain to the, the president of Electronic to, Arts to at trip. the time. Um, no, Trip. at that point, Trip was kind of... Uh, he was off with the uh, SMSGs, as we call them, the San Mateo secret guys. Okay. And they were making this little thing called a 3DO. So he was kind of like uh, not really day-to-day. -day. It was this guy, Larry Probst. Mm -hmm. um, and back then, I was like 22. So back then, um, they used to call me the kid. So it was, went all the way up to Larry and, and this other guy, Bing, Bing Gorton, oh, yeah. who's... Uh, Awesome guy. He he's like though the the real life personification of, of the um, American Dad. <laughs> so um, you know he's got like this hero jaw and he talks like he's like, hey, it's gonna be a mega hit. And 
he was like, whatever the kid wants. <laughs> and, and so uh, we yanked that out. And so, yeah, if you pop in um, uh, Jungle Strike, it just fades up and it fades down. Nice. Um, so that's like, you know. Saved him 58 uh, bytes of uh, memory. Yeah, sure. <laughs> But you were able to get it out in time, so that's what's important, right? Oh, is, yeah. Is that you made it, and it, it was a big hit. I remember Jungle Strike. Everybody was playing it. Um, a matter of fact, I was, at the time, I was working on a RTS-type game, and we looked at your guys' art a lot for our reference because it was top-down and yep. all that, and we're like, oh, these guys make a really cool-looking jungle, um, so how, you know, we'll do it. We'll just do what they did. <laughs> game never came out, but it was still really cool-looking. Oh, um, but yeah, it was great. Um, so right, let's skip back a little Sorry. bit before. No, no, no. That's that's this is how these things go. Um, <laughs> so I came across something very interesting in your history, your early history in game development, and it's something that um, you will be able to maybe answer a very important question that I'm sure everybody wants to know, which is: Is it Berenstain or Berenstein? Because you worked on a one of those Bears games, and I so worked you, on quite a few. You bears worked on quite games. a few of those. Uh, so wait, which one is it? It is Berenstain, and so we're, we're not in the darkest timeline. Uh, no, because it's were, always been that they were they were quite adamant about that actually, because <laughs> I swore up and down that I that it was a Steen, yeah. and um, even though you had worked on how many Stain games? Well, at that point, I I had just known you know the books and right, everything. Yeah. Uh, my producer was like, "Shh, don't don't." Don't ever do that. If they're here, don't ever say that. Don't think they're like, I was like, whoa, okay. Yeah. Um, and so it stuck. And sure enough, you know, I sat there and looked at all the text and everything that they sent us and, you know, signed, uh, you know, waivers for stuff. And I was like, oh, my gosh, it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah, it's it's, it's Berenstain. There okay. might be someone out there who's Photoshop happy that have changed something to say Berenstain <laughs> or Berenstain. All right, but so that's, that's good. We're, we're not actually an evil... 1985, we're still in. Well, presumably, <laughs> I don't know which I don't know which timeline we're in, but yeah, we're in the, right. we're in the stain timeline. We're in the stain timeline, but it's always been the stain timeline. Yeah. Okay. All right. And That's actually, good. I did the educational stuff. So I had like a stint of educational games. Yeah. I did did them not just because it was like, oh, this would be interesting to to do, you know, for my career or whatever, but it was, uh, you know, the kind of thing where. I had these these twins, <laughs> so I have two sets of twins, and so the first set of twins I had, and when you're just uh, out there, you know, making games for yourself and whatever, you don't care about things like benefits and whatnot. Now all of a sudden you have kids, and you're like, whoa, you know. It seems so, like a long way off, right, when you're young making games. Yeah, yeah, so a friend of mine, uh, Greg Thomas, uh, he was like, yeah, Tony, um, I know you need Bennies and all that fun stuff, um, and so uh, you know they they need someone over at, at Britannica Software, and I said, well, okay, um, but you know I make games, you know, <laughs> and and he's all, no, they want to do like this thing, like it, it's like educational entertainment, it's edutainment, <laughs> and, and that was back when the term was a good term. Right. Yeah, I guess people, so. People thought it was. Yeah, we're doing making. But I actually, it's funny. I've had people like back then fill out your resume and all that fun stuff. And I had like a recruiter some years later look and go, uh, "Yeah, you misspelled entertainment." And I said, "No, I haven't." Uh, so, well, then you misspelled education. And I said, "No, I haven't." <laughs> no, it's, it's edutainment. But yeah, I did it. You know, I thought, you know, this will be great. I can, I can do something and and leave it for my kids. Right. Um, but by the time they got old enough they didn't really care about you know fun with letters and, and all that fun stuff they right. were they were busy learning uh street fighter and sonic right. and stuff right so all right so maybe they didn't learn from it but what did you learn from those games that you then later applied to uh, other games that you made before that i made games for me i mean i've always made them for the the public like i i really i really love it when the public loves it, you yeah. know? And it's like, hey, you love me by extension, all right. <laughs> but I always made my game and then tuned it to taste and all that. But working on educational stuff or edutainment, because it was still like, it, they were still arcade games. Like the stuff that I did was arcade games that happened to have numbers and colors and, and stuff. But what was interesting was I, I felt like I, I cared more about what the player uh, was interested in. Like, 
like I said, I always I always cared if someone was having fun with my game. Sure. Yeah. Right. But outside of kind of superficial, are they having fun or did they put the the joystick down? Um, I I didn't care that much. But with the edutainment stuff, I cared what they were getting out of it. Mm -hmm. um, so that made me, uh, you know, care more about their moment to moment, especially stumbling blocks. Yeah. Yeah, when you're doing um, a platformer or Space Invaders or something, um, you're like, ah, whatever. It didn't you you didn't get past that boss? Get good. Right. But <laughs> if if a if a kid sits there and and they're stuck on trying to figure out how to get get the bear up the up the ladder, um, you care about you know the ergonomics of that. Right. You, you care whether they're um, actually learning because right. that's that's the goal of the game yeah, is, the, to, is to get the education out of it yeah the goal is for them to succeed and that's interesting that you say that because uh, it's, i find that to be a um a very common thing in young game designers right where they're like i don't care if you don't succeed but i think that there comes a moment where a game designer matures when they realize no you know what i think i want the player to succeed because yeah. they're going to have a better time, even if it's not educational. I mean, educational, obviously, the goal right. is to for them to learn and finish the product. But but even a game that isn't educational, you know, it can be just an action game or a first-person shooter or whatever, having them do well, for, at least for me, that's like, that's always, I had a, I literally know the moment in my career when I went from, I'm going to crush the player to, you know what, I want them to like the game. Yeah. Um, and so I, I think that a lot of, uh, us mature game designers have had that revelation some sooner than later. So it, it it's something you just you know you you learn over time, hopefully. Yeah, <laughs> but but well, they'll yeah, like your games more if they can finish them. Right? Yeah, and I mean that that doesn't necessarily mean make it easy. Right. You know, don't don't put checkpoints everywhere and all this <laughs> stuff like. It means that people are engaged and they're enjoying it. You know, the strike series is is, is notoriously hard. I would get so much static uh, for how hard it was, but the people that got into it loved it, and they you know they stuck with it. And so it was like, okay, well, it's not brutally punishing. It's just you know different than what. Um, what people who wanted something easier were looking for. I, I call it the difference between difficult and challenging. Yeah. Difficult is punishes the player, where challenging rewards the player. Right. right. And that, uh, uh, yeah, that's, that's an important thing, and that's probably in all my games is, is uh, it, and it's a timing thing. Yeah. You know, how much pressure do you apply and for how long? Right. And then if their head explodes, then you've gone too far. Probably. <laughs> it depends. But yeah. Depends probably. on the game, I guess, yeah. You did make Strider. Uh, uh, you know, <laughs> that one's interesting. Yeah, yeah. We'll talk about, let's yeah. talk about Strider in a second. I wanted to address a couple other things before. First of all, what is Normie's Beach babe Oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> oh, how much of this story do I want to rapidly tell? <laughs> Uh, yeah, remember at Electronic Arts, they called me the kid. So, um, they had a lot of people who were into a lot of different genres. I was definitely their go-to guy for action stuff. Mm -hmm. And to the point where they were like, a lot of the, the products you'll find that I did during the uh, Genesis era were uh, shepherding these games that EA had picked up for cheap, but didn't know what the hell to do with. Right. And and I knew a bunch of people from the demo scene who were doing stuff on the Sega and all this stuff. So I became the guy that they threw um, action games at. What were uh, a couple of those games? Battle Squadron, Crew Ball, basically any early EA action game. Even stuff that we pawned off. Um, so there was like a game, Harley's Humongous Adventure, <laughs> um, which I call. I said we should have called it Honey, I Shrunk Myself, because I was actually, I think, before that. that oh, um, actually before out. the Disney. Right, and right. it was, you know, it was a platformer where you you were a little guy and you shrunk yourself, and it was, uh, its gimmick was, um, it was all in clay. Oh, um, right. like, um, uh, what like was the Primal, uh, or, or yeah, the Neverhood. Clay Fighter. Oh, Neverhood. oh yeah, Clay also. Fighter, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well. So it was clay because it was visual concepts because oh, right, right. Uh, Greg Thomas and I go way back and we basically work on each other's games. Were anyway, you, were, so, was he animating stuff with you when you were a kid? No, oh, okay. no, no. I try and circle back around to how I met Greg. But um, to, to finish off Normie. So 
they throw all these things on my plate and I would do these things um, during downtime uh, from strike or during strike because uh, strike was the bread and butter. Um, but I like to do all these other things. So I'm shepherding these games and they hand me uh, these trouble products and um, one of them was this game, Normies Beach Babyorama, which actually was just called Normies. And it's based on a comic strip. Hmm. Okay. So there's a, an artist, uh, Keith Robinson, and um, he drew for Playboy, and I think Mad at some point. And so that kind of gives you an idea of his style of, of art and yeah. humor. And he knew people. <laughs> so he got a game signed. And I end up with this game on my lap, and... Um, was it a good game? It was not a good game. <laughs> okay. And it was a game that that looked kind of meh for the time. And I said, oh, okay, well, this thing is gonna go away. Like, at places like Electronic Arts, you have a lot of different milestones that they check up on you and go, okay, um, this is go, no, this is dead. And we were pretty ruthless back then. So I had um, a thing called Bloodliners, which was actually gonna be kind of awesome. We took the Road Rash engine and turned it into a Mad Maxi thing with uh, mega cities and all this fun stuff was kind of open. And of course, that gets killed. And I'm like, ah. But it was okay because I didn't really want to go to Belgium or something that the, the developer was in. But um, we're going down the list of stuff and then we get to Normies and they're talking about it and it's, it's very clear that nobody's really, nobody is really into it. And they're like, okay, so that's it. So yeah, okay, so we're gonna send Tony to El Segundo, right? <laughs> What? First of all, I don't, you know, I'm from San Francisco. I don't even know where El Segundo is at the time. The only thing I knew about it was uh, it was in a song from the Beastie Boys. <laughs> so, and actually, I think that Sanford and Son was set in El Segundo. But, and Mattel, uh, and Mattel is in El Segundo. Well, That's what I know about El Segundo. I don't know. They sent me down here uh, to this place, Real Time Associates. I bunked with, uh, bunked with them for two, three months. Wow. Um, and I was basically supposed to just produce it. I was supposed to just nudge them along. Um, and I'm like, I could have done that from home, so why, why am I here? Do I really need to be hovering over someone here? So I said, eh. So uh, I was like, okay, where are your tools? Redid a bunch of the levels with their tools. Um, and I, like I said, the, the art, I was like, eh. So I just decided to start redoing the art. Um, <laughs> and uh, just kind of went nuts. The, the thing about Normie, to wrap it up, was that um, it was all based on parody. You know, this guy's comic strip was all about parody. And especially back then in Electronic Arts, they were, they were shy and didn't want to spend any money on dealing with any sort of parody drama, you know. So like all the Star Trek parody, yanked. All of the, like, it, it's amazing we even had had um, Elvises and lawyers in the hell level because they were just like, no, 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 no. We're not protected like that. So you can't say that, you can't do that. So I had to yank a whole bunch of stuff out and that's why I ended up like just revamping the whole game. So it turned out to be an okay game with okay graphics instead of, uh, uh, horrible game with bad graphics. All right. Well, that's good. At least you were there to help elevate it up, right? Sure. <laughs> All right. Let's go on to something you might enjoy talking about more. After you were uh, with EA, you went to Crystal Dynamics. Oh, yeah. Now, Crystal Dynamics, it famously had what would be called a interesting working environment. Yeah. Uh, what do you remember from those days at Crystal D? Yeah, I have no idea what what their working environment's like now. But it was kind of it was kind of infamous back. Like everybody either wanted to work there, or they were like shaking their head over. I can't believe they're doing that at Crystal Dynamics. With your Googles and everything, people were like, "Yeah, you know, that's no big deal." But um, yeah, I went to to Crystal Dynamics. Um, a big reason was you know I was doing the Strike series and doing like Madden and doing all this stuff that was, you know, great. It's bread and butter stuff, but it's a little safe. And um, I'm never one to take it safe. So a friend of mine called who, um, he was in marketing at Electronic Arts and he left because he said he wanted to get into production and they weren't gonna allow him to make that shift. 
So he went to, uh, to Crystal Dynamics uh, to be a producer. And um, he calls me up and he goes, uh, hey, you should come over. Uh, I've got these licenses. I've got uh, Punisher and Ghost Rider. Wow. And, um, uh, you know, they're yours. And I'm like, well, what can I, you know, can I do anything I want with them? And he said, yeah. And I said, okay, so I'm going to make uh, Ghost Rider into Castlevania and I'm going to make Punisher into to Contra. And he goes, I don't care, just make the game. So I was like, okay, cool. Yeah, that's a great reason uh, to go. Yeah, and it, it was nothing like what EA would have done at the time. EA is very different now. Um, they've gone through several changes. Uh, but there's no way they would have done a what I had planned for Ghost Rider and Punisher, which unfortunately got killed, or what I did eventually end up working on, which was Legacy of Kane. There's no way Kane would have come out of, out of an uh, Electronic Arts in 1995, 96. So, well, it didn't make you cry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I miss those days. But yeah, so I go and I check it out, and um, laid back is, is, uh, is probably an understatement. Um, so Crystal Dynamics in the, um, in the mid to late 90s, they took over like a art studio. So it was a type of place where artists and like architects would normally be working, not video game people. So it wasn't like, you know, drab gray cubicles as high as the ceiling. I mean, it actually had a big uh, skylight for the ceiling. So the place was always drenched in, um, in natural light. It was quite nice. And all of the cube kind of things were on the outside. And in the center, uh, we had kind of a sunken living room kind of action going on. So there was like couches and everything. And there was a big giant TV, which back in the day, having a 50 inch TV was like, oh wow, you might as well have your own movie theater. So have this giant TV and um, hooked up to it was uh, a Neo Geo. And so every day, uh, we would um, uh, we would have Samurai Showdown oh, on nice. the Neo Geo in the quad, as we called it, in the center. There was basically like kind of like three factions. Whoever didn't didn't leave for lunch, and that actually people didn't leave for lunch because we had catered lunch every day, um, including I can't remember my wife would know, but I think it was Thursday we had sushi. Um, <laughs> so there was uh, Samurai Showdown going on. And lunch, you know, if lunch went over an hour or whatever, I mean, like, you know, you're, you're, you're playing. Uh, there was another faction who uh, played uh, Super Bomberman, and there was a Doom faction mm. that, that I, I didn't even realize was there for months until I wandered over. And I was like, oh, what are you guys doing? Wow, that's, that's crazy. That thing's making me nauseous um, <laughs> at the time. Yeah. Oh, and the best thing was um, people were competitive, but they weren't like, like, oh, you know, it, it, lots of smack talk. So uh, I still have, we would have dollar bets. So, you know, oh, you're gonna put up your, your you know, your ukiyo against, against my Maru or whatever. These, these are characters from um, uh, Samurai Shodown. So um, we would make dollar bets. Now, the bet's not about the dollar. The bet's about the fact that you have to write on the dollar whatever the person who won said. <laughs> and so uh, you go walking by people's cubes and you see dollars, you know. And even even the president of the company would have, you know, dollars up on <laughs> on their, their wall. So we had clicks and stuff at, at EA, but it wasn't the same. It, it felt... Uh, it felt very much like a like a very nice community at Crystal D back in those days. Yeah, I, I uh, remember going there once. This was in the nine ninety six, maybe somewhere on mm -hmm. there for barbecue lunch. Oh yeah, and, I guess uh, that they had a really good barbecue. I and then I remember that that sunken room. I was I was like, wow, this place is really cool, and it's kind of hip and almost like an artist loft yep. and. And then uh, that was it. That was, I think I only went that one time for lunch. I didn't come back. I don't know why. So while you were there, you worked on um, a game that uh, still has a pretty big following to this day, which is yeah. uh, Blood Omen Legacy of Cain. Um, you just worked on the first one, right? Yeah. Back in, back in the old days, I used to, uh, when you wrote design documents, you know, <laughs> you'd write like, and you'd write and 300, write. 400, um, 500 pages. Right, yeah. exactly. And so uh, the 
doc for Ghost Rider was somewhere around 270 pages. So all of the mechanics, because uh, I'm, a, I'm a mechanics kind of person, um, so the mechanics were down to the pixel. Like, I, I work all that stuff out beforehand. So there was a roadmap um, for how to execute, uh, you know, the Punisher and the, the Ghost Rider game, and then laterally, eventually, the, the Legacy of Cain. It's interesting because there are mechanics that I see Raziel doing that are basically how Ghost Rider was to play out, like this dimension shifting and his the way that his wall crawl works and kind of the way that um, the advanced box puzzles were, where you stick your fists in and move things around like that. That was that was all written up in Ghost Rider. Legacy of Kane, um, you know, there's uh, Amy Hennig. She uh, she came on board. We both worked together at Electronic Arts. Actually, um, she did the scrolling background that's in the background of uh, Desert Strike. Ah. Um, she used to be a pixel artist, so she came on board to Crystal Dynamics uh, as a designer. And her strength, you know, is in narrative, and my strength is in mechanics and layout and stuff. So uh, it was good. They partnered us up and it was kind of needed because the document um, that Silicon Knights had um, was, God, I can't remember how, it was, I can't remember how many pages, but it was about this thick <laughs> of lore. It was all just Yeah, just lore. background story, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was nothing but lore. There's no mechanics. Um, they actually had rendered every uh, frame for every character before even figuring out what they were going to do. Oh, my God. Um, and then kind of threw their hands in the air when I said, well, can we change this? Can we change that? I said, well, we already rendered it. Um, <laughs> and so it was like, okay, um, you guys say we're going to beat Zelda. When was the last time you guys played Zelda? We don't have any gating. Uh, we don't have any non-sentient things that are out to kill you. We just have a bunch of rendered people, um, a couple of rendered monsters, um, and this this engine that lets us go in any direction and then load stuff. Oh, wow, okay, awesome. So uh, Amy took the lore and went and went through it and you know um, chewed through that over the next however many, <laughs> yeah, I mean, literally, all, all the lore from, uh, you know, for Kane uh, comes from that gem that she, like, took all of that stuff and it ripped it apart. Found the heart of it, literally. I had to rip it apart and put it back together. Yeah. Um, I said, okay, uh, let's, let's take <laughs> all of these frames of things and let's, let's build a world that actually supports this lore. Right. And let's build mechanics and pacing and all of these things that you know are part of a game, so that people will actually play this thing and actually you know get through the very cool and rich lore. Right. That was Legacy of Cain. Sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you know, back then and, and, and to some degree now, it's like you once you get over the hump of going, oh, it's a lot of work. It, you just kind of get into it. I, I, I just get into it and slipstream, and I'm like, yay, okay, I'm just kind of going along, and and you know where the where the tide takes you. What was your favorite thing out of that game? Out of Kane? Yeah. I like the fact that uh, you get to play as an antihero. Mm -hmm. Oh, it was uh, one of the earliest games where you were an antihero, yeah. right? Again, it's something that like not kind of Punisher, never or, yeah, you know those yeah. comic book characters, but but it's like. It, it, like I said, it's again, it's something that Electronic Arts would have never done to have a character that you've got villagers who are like, save me, save me, and you're like, oh, I don't do that, <laughs> and you, you know, you flay them, and they burst into little, little particle blood, and you suck it back into you, and you're like, oh, that's health for me. It's like, wow, that's back then that was nuts, and actually, there's uh, someone should probably. Do a new Kane game. Well, that's what I was going to say. Would you ever go and do another Kane game? Maybe. Maybe. If they yeah. asked. Yeah. But it would have to be the right circumstances. If they were like, okay, here you go, and um, do what you want. Right. I mean, I don't need, like, absolute autonomy. You know, someone's paying the bills, so of course I'm going to listen to them. Right. But 
a lot of times um, people have their ideas of what the fan wants from you know the, the revival of a certain game like you know we're gonna talk about Strider so yeah, yeah. hold back a little but you know a lot of times what when when you're an exec or bean counter or even even a you know a, a well-meaning high up person that that can say no um, your perception is, and and your interests are different right. you know you, you you care about the production and getting it done and, and what it does for the studio and all that stuff right. versus uh, if you're a fan um, and say you're like a skilled fan that, that's made games for decades, well, then your perception of what should and shouldn't be done is going to be different. Uh, so as a fan of Kane and Strike and Strider, you know, when I look at them and how to attack them and, how, and what someone wants from it, it's it's different than most um, people who would green light things. Right, yeah, you're, you're, you found something to love in them though, right? Yeah, so. and, and I, I can kind of remember how I felt playing them. Right. And, and like I said, I lurk a lot. So <laughs> whatever you guys are saying, I absorb it all and then I go, okay, well, this is what they want, you know? Uh, and so. Uh, always better to give them what they want though, right? Yes. Yeah. Cool. So uh, after um, uh, Crystal D, and you worked with Cygnosis for a little while, um, then you moved on to um, uh, Post Linear, where you were a project <laughs> director. Now, was that the first time you were a project director? Uh, I guess. Um, what, what do you think? It, what was it like going from a design position to a director type position? And what do you think makes for a good director? It just meant more, um, more that you're responsible for. Mm -hmm. um, I tend to bleed anyway, so I, I'm the bleed, type bleed for the games. Not just that, but I, I'm the type of designer that um, I partner with every discipline. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, yeah. and so um, well, that's where your background was, right? Programming and programming design and art, and, art and, music and so and all that. What ends up happening is. Um, the people I work best with are the people I'm partnered with, right. not the people that work for me or I work for. You know, it's it's, it's kind of a, a flat thing. It's like if I if I'm looking at, at an environment or something and I say, yeah, that would do better if it was more green. You know, <laughs> then um, I call that blue rocking. Uh, yes, <laughs> blue rocking, right? Where you're like, I don't like that red rock. Make it blue. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but like. I tend to kind of, kind of art direct a little and sound direct a little. Well, but you can't help it. I mean, as a game designer, you're invested. All that is important, right? Like color choice is important, and oh, music yeah. and sound choice is important because a lot of it informs gameplay. Yeah. So you can't help yourself, particularly if you know something about how the sausage is made, right? Yeah. So with uh, with postlinear and and being. Uh, officially the director it, it was interesting because there were times where I go well I don't know how this should be what do you think <laughs> and like my producer would say doesn't matter what I think what do you think right. you know that's your job to yeah know what to think tell me what this is supposed to be and I'll tell you if we have the the money and manpower to do it right so it made you the authority yeah so it was interesting because I was doing what I was always doing before except for now is actually responsible for it. Uh, so, you know, it, you either you either crispen up and, you know, rise to it or you crumble underneath it. In the case of uh, this game, that was uh, Stargate SG-1. So that, I, I, I love the movie. I think, I think the movie, like, is still such fertile ground that hasn't been, hasn't been plowed. And so, I was like, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna dive in, and I'm gonna do this, and and it was like, okay, well, there's a TV show that we're making, and we're gonna go to different planets, and um, so, you know, you wanna, you wanna be synergistic with the TV show. Sure. Like, oh, okay, sure. Show me what you got. Yeah, we're kind of making it up. <laughs> so that was, um, like I said, the, the, you know, the Punisher and the Ghost Rider thing didn't, didn't um, really happen. So that was my first experience, really and truly. Uh, with a license uh, where I had to like actually 
care right. <laughs> about what the licensor said. Right. And so I was like, okay, um, going back and forth with these guys is so tedious. I am going to just um, throw out there the crazy and uh, see how far I can go. Mm -hmm. So Did it work? Um, yeah. <laughs> so I, I, uh, I drew up this guy and um, is, a, is a body of a scorpion with the upper torso of a man coming out of it. Um, and then he had like, you know, a um, whole like kind of Egyptian motif going on. And I thought, you know, this is just nuts, a scorpion atar, you know. So um, I sent it to him and said, I, wanna, I want this in the game. Because I figured, you know what, if they're gonna let this go, then I can probably do whatever I want. <laughs> and they looked at it and they said, oh yeah, it's great. <laughs> oh, you suckers. So I went nuts on the design for that game and then we were just kind of executing along and um, it was too big. Uh, it was too big. I don't know when we would have had to have cut a lot of stuff, but we would have had to have cut a lot of stuff. I think it was like seven planets, and each planet was like, I don't know, like had like a good 10 hours of gameplay in it. And it was just, it was absurd for, a, for a, a run and gun platforming action adventure thing. Um, I know how to execute it now, though. But <laughs> uh, they eventually, MGM, uh, uh, said, yeah, yeah, this game stuff that we were really excited about, yeah, we're not as excited about it anymore. Um, so we're going to sell off every game that we're working on, yeah, and we're just going to become a licensing house. So, yeah, you should probably find some place for your game. Um, I was like, what? <laughs> wow. Because they dropped that, um, I think, it was a couple of weeks before E3. So oh, we were no. working on, we were going to be on the floor show. Yeah. They had, from the show, the Stargate uh, prop. Oh, they built the ring. So they were bringing the ring yeah. over, you know, because it was somewhere over here, and they were just going to, you know, send it over to the LA Convention Center. Um, so they had the ring, which was gigantic, um, and uh, it was going to be the centerpiece for MGM's booth. And uh, we had a uh, single player demo and a multiplayer demo um, because Stargate SG-1 was built uh, for a company called Postlinear who had this technology called Transactor. Transactor authenticated purchases of what they call Lido's, limited edition digital objects. So they said, we are going to sell people digital things, digital whatever you put in your game, Tony. Wait, what year was this? Hmm. This was 1997? Where nobody was doing anything nobody like this. Nobody was doing anything like this. Right. Um, and so um, uh, that was also one of the reasons it was, it was so big was um, I had to justify the, uh, the 156 different weapons and armor and all this stuff, and each one of them was were nuts. Like Borderlands had nothing on this. I don't know how we were going to execute it with the crew that we had. Like, you know, we had to write like an entire uh, scripting system for the projectiles because projectiles literally had AI and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we had the multiplayer and we had the single player, and we we're marching towards E3. And I decided I was going to fine tune this level, and and I was going to do it at home. And I was at home, and my boss called me, and on speakerphone, he said, yeah, you know how you're going to work over the weekend? Uh, mm -hmm. And I said, I don't have to work over the weekend? And he said, no. And I said, do I have to work on this anymore at all? And he said, no. And I said, oh, that's great. Um, so yeah, just as it was all kind of coming together. Um, but they did release it, right? No. Oh, they didn't release Stargate it. Stargate is like... Um, it's like a black cat dancing on anyone's feet that gets near it. Like, like everyone that's ever tried to put out a Stargate game, they will they will tell you all kinds of horror stories. Really, that it never get. It used. It was like the, uh, what was it? The Champions Curse. Remember yes. that? Like there used to be the superhero game Champions, oh, yeah. and anybody who would make Champions, the company would go under, yep. the game would fail, whatever. Oh yeah. yeah. I, I I know not. Uh, you know, besides us, I know uh, I know of two other companies that have gone under trying to um, Try do to a Stargate. Stargate. Oh. Yeah. 
Right. Um, and you want to tempt fate and make another. <laughs> but um, yeah, that was that was fun. We I, I still went to E3. Oh, and the best part was this was when so it must have been ninety seven. This was when E3 was in uh, Hot Atlanta. Uh, oh, that was the best show ever. Yeah. <laughs> I still, to this day... Uh, I have permanent a, hearing damage from that show. <laughs> there's a there's a, an aroma of baked uh, um, uh, peanuts oh. um, that were very prevalent at, at the, uh, the uh, convention center in Atlanta. So whenever I smell that, it takes me back there. Wow. Um, yeah, it's good, good times. That was a good show. But, um, yeah, the funny thing is we actually... Um, uh, after the MGM guy has passed and said they couldn't sell them all this, they said, you know, um, do with what you want, but you can't use any of the Stargate stuff. Yes. Well, it's because I went wacky anyway, there's so much just random techno Egyptian stuff in there. So um, we actually ended up pitching to uh, Universal, who are working on a new movie with Brandon Fraser. Mm. <laughs> and. Um, so yeah, the the mummy guys saw all of our stuff, including the uh, centaur the sc scorpion. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and they put that in the film, right? It, I swear, it looks like the model that we did for the game <laughs> in the film, but and you didn't get your cut. No, I <sighs> rarely do. All right, yeah. Well, so I have some very nice jackets as memorabilia for. Universal. All the money I could have made. Oh, jeez. Uh, <laughs> yeah, tell me about it. Uh, all right. Um, I want to scoot ahead because you've got a lot of stuff you worked on. <laughs> um, so talk, let's talk about, I know Pacific Power and Light was interesting, but let's scoot ahead for uh, Collective, right? Because you mm -hmm. did a lot of big name stuff at the Collective, um, including uh, Star Wars Episode Three and Deep Space Nine, The Fallen, and Buffy the Vampire Slayer. So first of all, before we talk about any of those individual ones, what advice do you have somebody working on like big IP like that? Mm -hmm. Like how do you, And how do you make it your own? Right, because working on a Star Wars, you yeah. still have to be able to enjoy doing it, regardless of what limitations the IP holder has for you. I went into license games because I would see so many crappy license games, yeah. and I, go, I just don't understand. Come on, guys, really? Um, I, I now understand a lot more, but <laughs> even still, with the issues of going back and forth with the IP holder, um, time constraints, budget constraints. Uh, you can still you can still put your best foot forward with licenses. Uh, you need to immerse yourself in it um, so that you can understand what fits and what doesn't. Because so the second that you actually understand what fits and what doesn't, then you can start pitching. You know what you want to put into it, right. and if the IP holder has anything to do with the creative, because um, they don't always. A lot of times you're talking with just someone who's a numbers person, and they're shoveling on your ideas to someone who's super busy on some other project or something. But hopefully you get, you get your ideas and everything in front of uh, someone that, that understands the IP, probably help create it. They can recognize if you understand, you know? And uh, then you build trust. You know, it's just like you, you build trust with your team, you know, you build trust with the audience, you build trust with the, the person that, yeah, is the, the stakeholder, the IP. Right. Um, so They need to know it's in the right hands. Yeah, so yeah. With, with every single IP I've worked on, um, that was like, you know, job one, right. was to make sure that they understood, that I understand I understand their IP. I love it. I, I probably love it more than you do. <laughs> um, now, did you ever get in the room with the Lucases and the Whedons sure. and all those guys? Sure. Yeah. And did they realize you loved that stuff? Yeah. I that's mean, that's great. that. The face to face is always the best, yeah. you know, uh, because you know we're humans and we can read each other's face a lot better than we can read a bunch of text and, and pretty concepts. And so. Getting that face-to-face -face is, is hugely important. Um, you know, met with, um, uh, you know, X-Files. Oh, yeah. Right. It, 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 it's also not just like, oh, cool, I'm meeting, I'm meeting this person who's like, you know, made this, this great thing that I love. Um, but it, it's great to hear 
what they would uh, do, you know, if they weren't constrained. And so a lot of times I would actually like, like, you know, bait them into that and go like, oh, okay. So if you weren't on network or, uh, or you know, you had six hours, because this was pre-Netflix, so people didn't plan out big giant things like that, you know, for TV shows and whatnot, say, okay, so what would you do? Right. What would you want to do, you know? What was the best answer you got and from one of those? I was hoping you wouldn't come up with a question that, that would actually <laughs> stall me out. But that's a good question. Did my job, yes. What's <laughs> What's the best? Hmm. Let me think. Um, I, like, there were a lot of discussions on on Buffy with uh, Whedon and his crew talking about the kind of stuff that they want to do, the scale they want to do stuff. Be, but you know, they were just TV, right? And so I was like, man, we're just polygons. Yeah, you can so do anything. I can. You want. You, you want a sunken church and not just talk about it and be in a in a room, um, you know that's that's cute and lit. Okay, sure, I'll I'll give you a forty foot ceiling. I'll put I'll put the actual church underneath the ground and then you know you can roam around in it. Um, and <laughs> it's funny actually with the uh, that particular place, the sunken church. There was a there was a version of the level in the game for the longest time. And I just kind of left it um, in a really rough state because it's like there's just too many other things to get to, and this was kind of a it's kind of a side thing, you know. Little trust, I'll I'll do that for you. Um, and then we went to see uh, uh, Lord of the Rings mm. and the Lions of Moria. Yeah, and like you shall not pass. And I was like, ah, oh, all that lava and the staircase and all this. So after the movie, I just I just went. Back to work and um, and ripped the entire level apart and then made what I was inspired by the vision that right. I saw from Lord of the Rings. Buffy, the Lord of the Rings. Yeah. So by the time that Fox got the next build, which was only a few days later, um, their you know their their playtest team does what they do. They go on autopilot when you're playing something, and they're just like, oh, yeah, I'm going in this level. This level's been broken forever, and then they go. And all of a sudden, it's like lava, and there's like all these jumping puzzles and all this stuff. So, but they liked it. Yeah, they liked yeah, it. I like mean, it they didn't like bad. they didn't like the fact that I I, I would uh, rip stuff apart and then redo it in one night, right? Um, or or two. Uh, they really didn't like that that type of unpredictability. They didn't like, um, but they certainly like the um, the output on the other end. Right. All right. Well, that's good. Um, so, uh, all right, here's another one uh, that you did at The Collective. Um, you guys made a strategy chess game <laughs> published by LucasArts, Wrath Unleashed. How the heck did this game get made? Okay, so Wrath. Um, so the Hare Brothers and uh, Gary Priest, uh, they're all Brits. Oh, actually, oh, sorry, Harris, you'll, you'll kill me. They're Scots, and, and, uh, and Gary's a Brit. But uh, they grew up, you know, with old school games um, like we did. Like Archon. And, and yes, like yeah. Archon. So yeah. Archon is, is essentially battle chess. Uh, How many guys have played Archon? Come on, guys. It was essentially like <sighs> the computer version of the Star Wars right. chess game. Right. right. So um, we were all sitting around and talking about what, what would we do if we weren't doing other people's properties right, right now. Um, and we all kind of like like said, you know, oh yeah, that would be cool to do to take our style of like combat and then do um, something like an archon. So uh, a lot of times, uh, the Hair Brothers uh, would come to me, uh, and um, I did an enormous amount of pitches while at the collective. Uh, got really good at doing pitches, and our pitches weren't just like. Oh, here's a sheet and some pretty pictures of what it is that we want to do. Now, our pitches um, actually had functioning prototypes yeah. because our engine that we built and knew inside and out uh, was robust enough to do those kind of things. So, um, uh, Doug comes to me and goes, uh, "Yeah, so that uh, that Archon thing, we're gonna we're gonna try that." Um, 
And, and he shows me, you know, I was heads down on Lord knows what else, I don't remember, but um, somehow, you know, we had models, we had a couple of models uh, for uh, big wacky characters. Um, and, and it was like, yeah, so let's put together a pitch for this. I was like, okay, so we're making, we're making Archon? Oh, okay. So I wrote up a pitch for Archon and, um, and then another artist, uh, somehow they settled on the name Wrath and another artist did the, the logo and all that stuff. So we arranged these characters. The characters were rigged, the characters could move around and all that stuff, but they didn't really have real combat going on. Um, but we arranged it and put together some nice screenshots and, um, and uh, I slapped together a trailer. This is really good at slapping together trailers back then too. And, um, and the Harris let it leak <laughs> oh. that we were working on something. And then all of a sudden, you know, a day later, there were these screenshots. And then another day later, there was this trailer. Teaser, not a trailer, because it was like a few seconds. Um, and all of a sudden, it was like from the makers of Buffy and Indiana Jones at the time, um, is something. You don't know what it is. It's called Wrath. It has crazy looking characters that look like they're summons from a Final Fantasy game. And we don't know what it is, but holy crap, you know. So, and GameSpot back then loved us. So they ran an article. And next thing I know, because um, I'm back to doing whatever it is that's actually paying my bills, and um, we had a, a, a bidding war. Yeah. Now, because we had uh, the aforementioned, you know, Indiana Jones, uh, uh, you know, it went to LucasArts, and I don't think LucasArts knew what to do with the game. Right. It didn't seem like a type of game they were making at that time, right? They no. kind of got him past their, like this was kind of post uh, or at the end of Monkey Islands and... Grim Fandango's yeah, it was, and all that. And they it was weren't during, doing action games mostly. They were doing kind of adventure games, right? Well, it was not only that, but it was during their period where they doubled and tripled down on um, on their bread and butter, Star Wars right. and, and Indiana Jones. Right. Um, yeah, there's a really cool Indiana Jones trilogy game that might or might not exist out there um, that we did that never saw a light day because we all got diverted onto Star Wars. Uh, but, yeah, they, they took it on, but like I said, they didn't really understand it. Mm -hmm. and, and to be honest, I think a lot of the people who are working on it didn't understand it. Um, so I, I think I was probably in pre-production on Star Wars, or I can't remember what I was working on, but there was a period where I was not on Wrath. Hmm. Or not, <laughs> and so there are a lot of there's a lot of things in Wrath uh, that uh, work against it. Right, you would have done differently. Yeah, yeah. And, it, and it's one of those things where, uh, as a designer, it it's important to have vision, you know, innovation and push the envelope. It's also very good to just be very good at executing. You know, it doesn't have to set the world on fire, it just has to be executed very well. Um, but it's also, it's very important to know when to cut bait and also w how to work within that box, you know. So uh, there were things that Wrath was trying to do that our box did not want to do, you know, that our engine did not want to do. Our engine was very good at doing buffies and striders and getting up and Star Wars and, um, Killer Instincts, and yeah. actually act, that engine, that engine did, did a lot. It did a lot more than you would think. But the but a lot of action, right? You know, third person, third person action, static uh, environments, and all that. Not a crazy chessboard that then zooms into you fighting in an arena, mano a mano, with these characters that were also built to scale. They're supposed to be like you know, they're supposed to be like two stories tall and they actually built them that size. And it's just like, uh, so the engine was also having problems with that because you know you get rounding errors further you get away from zero and anyway. 
it, it was crazy. But yeah. What was it like to work on the very last Star Wars game ever? Because we all know that episode three was the end of Star Wars movies, right? That there were never going to be any more Star Wars movies after Lucas was done with episode three. Because he was done. He, told, he did everything, he told us everything we were supposed to know, right? I know. What was it like working on that, on the last Star Wars game ever? Holy cow. Uh, <laughs> I'm a huge Star Wars fan. Like, like, if anybody knows anything about me, there's two things they know I love, and it's Prince and Star Wars. Yeah. Uh, and it's all over my house, and, and it's in the fiber you of my You should come and visit my house. Really? I have a lot in common, yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay, so, um, again, Doug, Doug Hare, uh, head of production, comes in and goes, so Tony, do you, do you like Star Wars? <laughs> and it's, it's hilarious because I'm in my office, in which your... is covered in Star Wars. There's a Millennium Falcon hanging from my Star Wars my pajamas monitor. for There's, the late nights yeah. you're spending at the... My, <laughs> my uh, on the walls are, are my one sheets. That's a movie poster from, uh, you know, uh, New Hope, Empire, uh, Return, and Revenge. Nice. So... They're all up on the wall. The whole place is Star Wars, if it's nothing else. Uh, and I said, oh, are you kidding? And he goes, you, well, you know, we're going to work on Vader. So I'm like, uh, wow, we're working on a Vader, a Vader game. Interesting. Because that's what his code name. Uh, and I um, said, why aren't you excited, Tony? Uh, and that's another thing. If anybody knows me, I'm, I'm not... I'm kind of this laid back kind of person. Uh, but I said, man, you know I hate everything when we're finally done. Like there's a, there's a point you get immersed into these things so much um, that you just, you just don't want to be around it, you know, right. for a while. So they were going to make you hate Star Wars. Right. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like okay. Uh, and then he goes, but it's for the movie, uh-huh. right? And I was like, Oh my God, you're killing me. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. So not only am I going to hate Star Wars by the time I'm done with this, but I'm, um, uh, I'm going to see how the sausage is made. Yeah. All right, let's do it. Did you, get the, did you get the two hours in the locked room with the script? That experience? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, well, and it was uh, with a bunch of other people, too. Um, yeah, that script was really dense. Um, it was, and I thought, okay, that seems cool, you know. Uh, but if I, anything I know about scripts, this is going to be like three hours long. Uh, like, ah, I just figure it out in the mix. And I'm thinking, well, that's cool because it, it's the last Star Wars. Three-hour Star Wars? Sure. I mean, one of my favorites, Cameron, does three hours, and I, I never blink at it. So... We all knew the ship was going to sink, but we still sat there for three hours. <laughs> so, yeah. Then they said, well, you guys aren't actually making it. You're going to partner with us. Um, and we're going to use your engine. And really, you're just going to be consultants. And I, I chuckled. I said, like, we barely get our stuff done with our engine. There's no way you guys are going to be able to just dive in. Like, how long do we have? We have a year? To do this, it, I said, no, 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 no. We're gonna need, we're gonna need a bigger boat. <laughs> um, so it went from this consulting thing to a partnership to then Order sixty six kind of happened. <laughs> <sighs> Sorry for a bunch of the people that got caught in a splash damage, but uh, basically, the collective worked at a certain pace, um, which was very rapid. Um, we had a certain cadence, and um, we knew the engine, and we'd done lots of, of um, licenses up to that point. And even the people that were just, you know, the, at the collective, even if you weren't working at that pace, you were, because everyone else around you was. And, and, and the leadership just kind of moved everything along. So while things at LucasArts were different, they were like, yeah. This is cool. Yeah, we'll get around to that. We're like, no, we don't have time. We don't have time. Uh, and so at some point, um, uh, basically a bunch of the people who were at Lucas 
uh, got shown the door, unfortunately, mm -hmm. as Lucas decided, uh, we're not going to do any internal development. Everything goes outside. Well, we needed people anyway, so we grabbed a bunch of the people that were, uh, that were at Lucas, um, but that was still only probably about a third of the LucasArts people. Uh, but we, uh, we assimilated them, and then uh, the game that you see, uh, the, the, the Star Wars Episode Three: Revenge of the Sith, the movie game, <laughs> um, was done actually in about nine months. Wow. Yeah, and the best part was uh, the game we were making originally, uh, especially once we just got full control over it, was basically going to be more like Buffy with lightsabers. Right where it was like an open kind of thing and, and you know, if I want to go over there and try and force jump up there, then I can do it and all that. Um, on one of my many trips up to ILM uh, and the ranch, which really, you know, you were hardly ever on the ranch, but ILM was down the street. They, um, they brought in a guy, and luckily I can't remember his name, <laughs> but he was a suit. And he came from Lucasfilm, and he was marketing there, and he said, you know, I've been selling Star Wars for years, and I thought to myself, you've been selling, you know, AC to people in hell, so yeah. Uh, but he was like, I know everything about what, I know what people want. And he slapped down onto the desk copies of um, uh, Lord of the Rings Two Towers, which Electronic Arts had done. Right. Yeah. And that was a top-down-ish, gauntlet-ish, yeah. you know. Um, it, was, it was very shallow, but it was a very well-executed spectacle. And um, I said, that's not the game we're making. And he's all, if you just give me that with lightsabers, I can sell it. Like, but that's not the game we're making. The game that we're making had... had basically Jedi Order is what we were making, you know. Uh, it is far more intimate. It was a, f a smaller number of, of um, encounters and, you know, wasn't about all of this spectacle. It was about intricate lightsaber and force combat and going wherever the hell you want it within the constraints that we had. Not a top-down, um, I don't know, like gauntlet's the best I could, yeah. I could call yeah. it. Yeah. So we had to retool a lot of stuff. So they forced you to make that game rather than the one you were working on. They were the IP holder, yeah. so. Got to make them happy, right? Yeah. So, all right. Um, well, all right, I still enjoyed it, regardless. Um, I liked it, and I eventually, I can't remember how many years later, I eventually watched the movie. Um, <laughs> you never saw it when it came out? No, there was twice. So one time they said, hey, um, you want to go up to the ranch and see it? And, uh, but, you know, it, 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 it's just the leads. And I said, so the entire team's not going to be able to go up there and see it. Oh, and right. I said, eh, you know what, give my ticket to someone else. Right. Um, and that was really actually part being magnanimous, but really I was just bitter. Um, <laughs> and then uh, later on, uh, they were like, oh, okay, the collective, the team, the team down at the collective can go see it at the arc light, at the premiere of the arc light. So again, I, they're like, oh, you're going to go see it, Tony. And I said, okay, can I um, bring my wife? And they're like, nah. And I said, mm, you know what? I'm good. Right. The upside of that was um, uh, people felt bad. So in the mail, um, after the game it released and, you know, sold 4.5 million units and everybody was all happy, uh, a poster shows up. And it's the one sheet for uh, episode three, mm -hmm. and it's signed by George. Nice. And so um, my so wife insisted on getting that. Put frame. that up on the wall next to Revenge and some of those other ones. Yeah, I should do that one day. Yeah. But I, she did insist on getting it framed and all that fun that's stuff. Okay. <laughs> cool. It didn't ruin Star Wars then for you? No, no. I still, I, I, I finally, I, I, I got over it, and I watched the movie, and it was funny because I was like, oh, wow, there's a lot of stuff cut out. Um, and, uh, no, I still love Star Wars. That's good. And um, I will not watch the trailer for the new one because watching the trailer for Force Awakens kind of ruined it. Yeah. Showed all this cool stuff. Yeah. And there's a moment where 
uh, they say the running uh, uh, Finn and, and uh, Ray and they go, oh, we'll take the junk. And they turn and there's the Millennium Falcon. My heart jumped. And I was like, oh. And I realized after I watched the movie, I would have had a lot more moments like that where my heart jumped and I was really excited and into it if I hadn't have known beforehand. All right, so no spoilers for Tony then. <laughs> Uh, all right, so um, one more question about Collective. You said you did an enormous amount of pitches. Mm. Um, what Do you have a, like a rule for what makes for a good pitch? So, yeah, my golden rule is... Um, uh, <laughs> this is an old EAism. Simple, hot, and deep. Okay. Um, <laughs> so uh, the idea is simple. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's easy to get into. Everybody can understand it. Um, and it has heat. So instantly there's something, there's something there that you're like, oh. Right, the yeah. X, the X and the Y I heard yeah. it called. I wanna, I, wanna, I wanna see that, I wanna feel that, I wanna play that. I, I haven't played that or whatever. Right. And again, it doesn't have to be like the, oh, holy grail of super innovation and all that fun stuff. Right. Uh, it just has to be something that like, people are like, yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's the heat. And then uh, the, the deep is, where you take, uh, you dig down on something, one thing, something that's, you know, some mechanic or, or lore or whatever, and you go into it a little bit more. Um, in the pitch? In the pitch, but just a little. Okay. Not, you know, um, and a little for me is, <laughs> is a relative term. But um, <laughs> you go into it, again, enough so that you hook. You know, you get people who are like, yeah, I wanted to see that, I wanted to see that. Oh, he started describing something. Oh, I can see that, I can see that gameplay. I want more of that. And that's how you pitch. You, you pitch it so that it's just a tease, here's a taste, it's like, it's like a drug dealer. But I mean, realistically, <laughs> that, that's, that's, that's what you're doing, is you're, you're hooking people, uh, you're making them want more of whatever it is that you're selling. Right, um, and then they hopefully throw you a nice big budget and you can make it. Yeah. yeah. All right, cool. Thank you. Great advice. I was going to ask about your Medal of Honor experiences because you worked on a lot of those. You worked on four of them? No, no, no. How many did you work on? No, no, no. The, the one, the reboot, I guess. Oh, the reboot. You yeah. just worked on one. You yeah. didn't do any of the Airborne or Warfighter or those? Oh, God. No, it, but I'm interested in. in <laughs> I don't know. I, I probably I, I probably have a special thanks in there. That's probably. Oh, right. okay. All right. Well, what, um, so you worked on the original one? No, so no. Mo 2010, Medal of Honor 2010, which was actually called Anaconda, and I wish they had kept those names because I hate all these names that just have the number at the end. Right. Decided to go back to EA, um, and they were calling, and um, they're down here also. Yeah. So it was, you know, um, since I was living down here, I was like, oh yeah, um, what do you got? Uh, and I looked at f three games, um, and they were all in different states of broken. Um, <laughs> Sensing a pattern here. <laughs> yeah, I, I do a lot of firefighting. Uh, but um, so there was this thing called Tiberium, which was based on the CNC universe. Oh, right, right, yeah. Um, and it was basically supposed to be Electronic Arts Halo Killer. Uh, there was a, a game called Elemento, uh, which was oh, uh, Spielberg's. The Spielberg project. Yeah. yeah. Um, and there was um, Anaconda, which was Medal of Honor. So uh, the Guys who are working on Tiberium, uh, that poor team, they had been through a lot. Um, and uh, they, had, they had people who <laughs> didn't know how to defend. So when you're in a big company, um, and actually I noticed this uh, with Indies and their, their cycle talking with the public, um, you have to take everything that everyone says and go, that's great. But <laughs> your job as a designer is not to do what someone else said. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter if they come with the most passion about this one little thing. You have to synthesize everything that everyone says. You have to make sure that it, it works for whatever it is, whatever vision you have, right? And so... They had a lot of turnover and flip-flop on Tiberium because uh, they would take in anything that anybody said. And um, Elemento, the Spielberg project, I talked with them and I got four different ideas or 
you know, pitches of what this game was supposed to be uh, from the different people I talked to. No one person actually said anything that, that actually overlapped with the other one. So they all had different ideas. This is the leadership of, of it, and they all had different ideas of what this game was supposed to be. It was the elephant, right? <laughs> elephant feels like an ear, feels like a tail, yeah. feels like a yeah. side. Yeah, exactly. It's a blind guy feeling up an elephant. So um, I said, oh, well, that's a problem. And it's funny because I, I, I listened to all of them and I said, oh, okay, so you're making uh, Half-Life meet Starman. Um, or ET, or you know, nowadays you would say you would say Half Life meets um, uh, Stranger Things. Mm -hmm. uh, they're all the same story, uh, which is you know, alien, fish out of water, um, seems innocent, actually super powerful, comes and you know is being chased by people who aren't even remotely as powerful, but somehow scare them, and that was essentially the send up for Elemento. But they didn't recognize that, and they said, oh. Like, like, I had somehow turned on a light, and I was like, ah, oh, huh. Middle of Honor team were like, yeah, yeah, you know, we're doing good with, with uh, Airborne, but, you know, then Call of Duty comes out with Modern Warfare, and holy yeah. crap, and I was like, yeah, <laughs> holy crap. Um, I liked them because they understood where they were in the whole pantheon of things. They were um, hungry. They were like, you know, we're gonna beat COD. Yeah, we're gonna be scrappy and we're, we're gonna fight, you know, we're coming back. And I liked that. I liked the, the fight that they wanted to take to them. And so I said, mm, I'll take that one over there. Right. Those are the guys for you. Yeah. yeah. I, like, I like people that wanna fight. Awesome. Um, one of your employees once said that you told them to step up their setups. What is oh, that? wow, you've gone and talked to people. What does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> um, that, that is, uh, you know, I have a baseline for what's acceptable that goes in the game. And, the, and a lot of times that's what ends up, people just kind of end up putting that in. And you're like, yeah. It's a game, but that's like filler, or maybe that's like just a, it's a step above filler, right. you know? So you're yeah. saying that whatever the initial quality of the thing that you are presenting needs to be better than just sufficient. Yeah, and the thing is, it's like, okay, so I do a lot of action adventure stuff and, you know, first-person shooter stuff and all that stuff. So all of those games are generally about encounters mm -hmm. and um, I, I don't know if every designer looks at, at these things like I, I look at them as a three act play. Every, every encounter to me has a you know, beginning, middle and end. Yeah, absolutely. And um, so a lot of times, and you can feel it when you go in your play a game, you can feel the second that you, tr you crossed a trigger boundary, you can feel <laughs> it, oh look, they're spawning 10 guys. Awesome. Right, um, let me step up three steps and they'll go away. Yeah. And, and so that's kind of where that, you know, step up your setup came from is like, come on, man. This thing is, this is predictable and um, it, doesn't, it doesn't take into account before or after it happens. It just happens. Right. And it just is. It just is. And sometimes, you know, you have some just is, right? Nothing is 100% perfect, right. but there's a threshold. You get past too much just is, and then the whole game just starts to fall apart. It right. starts to just Or, or even just worse, is. it just settles. Yeah. Right, it just becomes this consistent tone, and that's it. Yeah. yeah. Okay, all right, now I get it. Uh, good advice. Uh, all right, so let's talk about your the game you said you always wanted to work on, hmm. uh, which is Strider 2014. So we are now uh, four or five years past Strider, mm. so we survived. Um, <laughs> what did your fandom bring to the project, and where did it hold you back? Hmm. My fandom brought everything to the project. It happened. <laughs> um, uh, I, actually, I think I, I am absolutely certain that my fandom um, 
helped a lot with what goes in and what did not go in. Um, Capcom Japan were basically like, okay, here's this little thing with this little budget, like that Bionic Commando. Yep. Re re yeah, 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 that was great. Um, we're gonna, you know, we'll let them be our hands and they'll basically just make uh, Strider 2. Um, and, I, and I mean that in the sense of there's a game, so there's Strider, and then there's Strider 2, which is, uh, a, me, is a PlayStation Dreamcast game that they did. So it has a little sprite, and its backgrounds are 3D, but it's really, it's really just an, uh, an iteration on Strider, right. um, the arcade game. And uh, I said that won't work will have to generate too much in today's age where someone expects a game to last more than a half an hour because we're not just siphoning quarters out of them. So I um, said what I would do is I would do a Metroidvania. So, um, and this was before the Metroidvania craze became so big, but um, I explained to them, you know, why I would do it because, you know, we can, get a lot of use out of the elements that we build and all this, and, and you can just have this power fantasy of becoming more and more powerful for, for uh, you know, being Strider. Uh, and they were like, hmm, maybe. Uh, and then I said, well, this way we're paying homage to the NES game, which to be truthfully, I kind of didn't want to acknowledge at all. <laughs> but. Um, uh, and then they said, oh, okay, okay. And said, glory days. Yeah. Well, I think, it, it, again, this is the, the, the gaining trust kind of thing. Right. Um, I think to, to let me do whatever I wanted to, they were very hesitant about that. So they had to be sure that I knew what I was talking about and yeah. what I wanted to do. And so if they ever had a question, I... I had an answer, right. um, and the fun part was I knew just enough Japanese during the call so I could get ahead of them because they'd be talking amongst themselves, and then the translator would say, "Oh, this is what they said," right. and I I leaned to my producer and go, "That's not really what they said," <laughs> uh, but I'd have answers uh, a bit faster than I think they were anticipating, um, which helped build confidence also, right. uh, and because uh, you know I knew. I knew the property, and as a fan, I'd been thinking about it for you know over 20 years, and I knew what I wanted from it. Um, and so we quickly established, here's what I want to do. I got what you guys want to do. That's nice. Here's what I want to do. And um, not only that, but here are the elements I don't want to do right. that I would do if this wasn't Strider. I'm mm -hmm. saying, like, I would make this game regardless of you guys. And it would have X, Y, and Z. It would have so much more in this direction, be, but that's not Strider. Right. So letting them know that I knew what was and what wasn't Strider um, helped also. Yeah, it's learning the license, like you were saying before, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, if somebody came to you and said, uh, here's the red pill, this is Legacy of Kane, and the blue pill is Strider, which one would you pick? Uh, I'd pick Strider. you pick Strider? Yeah. yeah. All right. I'd do another one of those. Yeah. yeah no, 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 no offense to Kane. I think that, <laughs> I think they're, they, they have some similarities though, but um, the Strider is like this fast, visceral um, visual he's riot. He's almost like Sonic. Oh, yeah. In a way, right? Oh, it's funny you should say that. Did you talk to somebody again? Because, like, <laughs> um, yeah, I said, um, I said, you know, this, there was a point where we were actually um, liking it to Sonic, and, I, and uh, we had the phrase, um, hot scissors cutting, cutting through flesh, <laughs> um, which we eventually had to pretend were robots. But, um, yeah, like a lot of, a lot of Sonic a lot of Rocket Knight Adventures, right. Right. Um, a lot of Mega Man X. It's, it's all of those things, and it's every bit of Strider that people know. Right. Cool. Um, all right. I'm, I feel like I'm skipping over huge 
swaths of your career. But I did want to ask what I think is an important question, which is, um, first of all, congratulations on your uh, Blacks in Gaming Industry Lifetime Achievement Award. My God. Have, you're not done with your lifetime, though. No. <laughs> no. I, I think I, it was a bit I, presumptuous for them to, to say it was lifetime because you still got a lot to do. But, that's okay. But that said, um, do you have any thoughts on how to get more diverse creators into the gaming industry? Um, yeah, I've been thinking about that more and more, uh, <laughs> of course. Um, I, you know, there's a lot of, of things that are happening right now that are really helping with that. Yeah. Um, a lot of programs in, in large companies that are, that are helping with that. Um, I, I'm looking more at not like how, how do we get people into companies, but more how do we get people to look at it at, at and go, that's something I want to do. Yeah. It's like you play games, right? You know, so would you want to make one? Mm-hmm. Everyone kind of wanted to make one. But, you know, are you willing to put in the, the work and the discipline to actually do it? And just step up your step up. Right. <laughs> and so um, lately I've been looking at, at reaching out and it's easy, you know, easier with the indies uh, and talking to people and, and basically saying, like, you know, you, you can do it. I mean, there's free engines that are amazing. Yeah. And, and free. Yeah. Yeah. Relatively, but yeah, mostly. <laughs> um, and so I'm looking at helping uh, on that front where it's like people that want to do or never thought they could, hey, I'm here, I did it, uh, you can too, and um, you know, here's some help, here's, here's a push, because there's so many avenues right now that if, it, if there was uh, some sort of wall in your way, um, just just go around it, you know, <laughs> or kick it down. Yeah, All right. yeah, excellent. Well, that sounds like a great transition to questions. So, uh, uh, any of you have any questions for Tony? The mic is right there. Please go ahead and ask him. Let's let's hear what you guys have to say. Tony. Yeah. So. Um, for uh, all those uh, would-be designers out there who need to make the transition from becoming a junior designer to a, maybe a more senior designer, what uh, recommendations do you have for them to kind of um, mature their skill set to be effective? Hmm. Um, hmm. Listen. <laughs> Listening is listening's important. So uh, whatever it was, you know, two hours ago or whatever, <laughs> um, when I was talking about when I make games for for me, you know, I, I, I care what the player, because I want you to have fun, but I, I kind of didn't. Um, <laughs> finding that balance between your vision and and whether you're actually engaging the player, I find is one of the biggest things to help universally designers to help them mature. Um, Kind of getting out of out of your own headspace and out of your own way, and looking at someone, and uh, t- you know, you can even take someone. I mean, there's diminishing returns on on certain things, but you could take someone that does not like your game. That's like, nah, that game's not for me. And, and you go, oh, well, what would make it for you? Again, don't do every single thing that someone says. Right? That's that's. That's a recipe for disaster. Um, but listen to them and try and synthes- you know, synthesize what they've said and say, oh, okay, that'll work here, or I can tweak that. As a matter of fact, I had a friend of mine. I sent him a, a video of something, this little side thing that I'm working on, and he goes, ah, I'm going to have to play it. <laughs> um, I don't know. And, I, and, and for a second there, I was like, ah. It was just like, now, because I respect this guy, uh, I wasn't going to just, like, dismiss what he had to say. I had to, like, detox from the fact that he didn't love it like everyone else and, and listen. So it was like, okay, what don't you like? So we go back and forth on a few things, and then I go and I look at it. And um, because you're playing it so much, a lot of times a good thing to do is to film yourself playing it or film someone else playing it. So 
I filmed myself and I looked at it and I said, hmm, okay. From his point of view, what he's saying, where he's like, I don't know, I'd have to touch it. And I'm like, you shouldn't have to touch it. You should just see it and love it. <laughs> uh, okay, I can kind of see some of the issues. He's, you know, he, and people aren't necessarily going to be able to tell you exactly what's wrong with your game and all that. You have to listen. You listen, you take it all in, you synthesize, and then you go, okay, they said this doesn't feel right. Well, it's actually not that it doesn't feel right. What it is is the animation is like two frames off or something like that. You know, it can literally be something as simple as that that can just just devastate someone's enjoyment with it. So, yeah, listen, and then you know you have to you have to like take in the criticism. As a matter of fact, seek out criticism because the people that love love it, they're gonna love it anyway. When you were working at Crystal Dynamics, did you like how kind of laid back they were, or was that not your thing? Um, at the time, I loved it. Uh, nowadays, I kind of like something in the middle. Uh, if things are too laid back, you can get into this malaise where you're just kind of kicking it with your friends and pushing a can down the street. Yeah, I guess. And then all of a sudden, you know, if, if you have a publisher or something, you know, because everybody has to pay bills, then all of a sudden you have to um, pay the bills. And it's just like, holy crap. I, I like things where there's a little bit of urgency, but I don't like to be crunch and all that fun stuff. You know, I'm old, so screw that. <laughs> we uh, did enough crunch. Oh, God, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not gonna bring out the crunch badges. <laughs> so how important do you think it is that an indie, indie developer knows all areas and all aspects of game development? as opposed to maybe focusing on one specific area? Because if you're trying to work on bigger projects and work your way up, do you have to know how to do every part? Or is it okay to focus on a couple key areas and maybe work with somebody else that does the other areas that you're not strong in? And is that a way that you can actually work up to a point of a director of a game? Um, okay, so I think... Um, I think it's important for any designer um, and developer in general to actually understand other disciplines. Um, I think it makes you, a, certainly in, in the sense of design, it makes it, it makes you a better designer if you understand a bit about art and you know some coding. Um, but the the one man show road is hard, you know. Even if you're an adept at at every aspect, you can't do them all at once, right? So that just, that, that makes the time just stretch on and on and on. And, and in some cases, like, um, time can help, you know, it, it can make you lose your objectivity, things like that. So being indie, you need to keep it, you need to keep it small, tight, you know, that's your, that's your budget, that's your thing. And on top of that, uh, keeping it small helps with pushing the vision, which are usually um, not your kind of average, you know, like I said, asset orgies. Uh, they're, they're, they're something that's, you know, it's a little more garage band. So you wanna keep your crew tight, but if you can get help, get help. Because at the end of the day, it's about getting the game out and getting the game out into people's hands. You know, so mm -hmm. otherwise, just just sit in your bedroom with your thoughts and go, yeah, ah, oh, that's that's the coolest game I ever played. Too bad no one else played it. <laughs> um, so, I, I I think it's it's good to get help, and when you have that help, you know, you gotta you gotta learn to work with other people, man, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> which is fun, and. Um, that can help you, you know, to direct because, it, it, especially if it's if it's your vision, then you have to be able to communicate what your vision is to these people, and you have to, it, in the sense of indie, you can't go like a couple of weeks or a month and go, yeah, I'm gonna get around to that thing and whatever, you know, your your burn is is knocking at your door, so. 
you need to learn quickly how to convey to people what it is that you're looking for. You know, try and hit, try and hit it right or close to right as, as soon as possible so that you can get it in, iterate, iterate, iterate. Um, so I do think that working with other people in a nice small team is a, is a good thing. That said, of course, I'm, I'm doing something by myself, but that's just me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. Yeah. Hi, um, thank you for a wonderful listen. Um, let me see if I can phrase this correctly. So you've, all the work that you've done is in larger structures. But, no. Okay, so what would, what like mechanisms or things that you've used or been implemented that if you were in charge of a smaller studio, you think would translate very well? Um, discipline. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like more towards like pipeline. Kind no, of. that's exactly what I mean. Discipline. Okay. So, one thing that Electronic Arts was really good at teaching me, in particular in the early days, was um, they would draw a line in the sand and go, "Here's when you are going to ship. Make something between this and this." that fits the brief that you wrote. We had these things called YAs. So you wrote a brief and it was literally like, you know, your hot button topic that said, you know, uh, Resident Evil in space. And then your next paragraph went on to describe a game called Black Sun that actually somehow got turned into dead space, but that's another story. Um, so you do that, you have your YA, you get greenlit, right? So they wanna see, or back then especially, from this, to that line in the sand. We'll check back with you around Alpha to make sure you're okay and that we're gonna start making really cool you know, manuals and stuff. But the stuff in between, that's you, go. Um, go make something that's going to hit this date and hit these numbers that we said it's gonna do based upon this little brief. So the, the discipline comes in where you go, okay, this thing would be really cool as you know, you're going along and making something. This would be so cool, it'd be awesome. But you know what? That doesn't fit in this time. Or, you know what? That really, the, the best part about the, the constraints is that it makes you really look hard and go, that doesn't fit this game. Um, a wise man said to me, uh, save it for the sequel. <laughs> you know, he was, he was, uh, he saw me sitting there and it was like, 10, 30 or so at night working on stuff. And he was like, what are, you, what are you doing? What are you doing here? And I'm like, I have to get this in. I have to get this in. He's all, save it for the sequel. Like, get this one done and get everything in it great. And then you'll get a sequel. You'll make another one. And the reality is, yeah. You know, if you don't, if you're not disciplined and you don't make that, first one or that game great it, all of these ideas and everything just, they don't matter mm -hmm. you know sometimes you just got to look at it and go would be cool doesn't fit save it for the sequel all right makes sense thank you this is a great talk it's absolutely a master class in a single session i could listen to you all night <laughs> my big question is hot buttons for managing licensing and IP. Where are the bit, what are the biggest gotchas when handling it? Is it typically the license holder that tank a project? Or is there something that you can do to keep the ball in your court and ensure that? Um, well, I mean, okay, if, while you're thinking, I have an answer, maybe it'll help you. And that is, it's getting the flow of material from them to you. Because So I've worked on several licensed things, and there was always the biggest stumbling block was you're waiting for the script. Well, the script's not done yet. We're rewriting the script. Or we're waiting for concept art. Well, we're changing the concept art. Or we're waiting on what's the environment going to look like. Well, we, we've decided to rebuild the sets, and we're going to do some reshoots, but that's not for another few weeks. Well, can we come and see the sets? Well, no, not yet. Or can we get, you know, take a look at the, the costumes or the weapons? Well, we're, we're changing those, right? So that, for me, in my experience, that was the biggest stumbling block was making sure that the, and this goes back to what you're saying, Tony, about the relationship between the IP holder and yourself, was 
building the trust to get them to the point where they're like, come on up, come on up and look at this stuff. We've got all this great stuff. Let us walk you through, show you what you have. And you're furiously taking notes or if you're lucky enough snapping pictures or scanning artwork or whatever. So then you have the material that you need to go back and actually build the thing based on the thing that they are building. Yeah, I mean, that actually is an exact scenario that happened on um, Star Wars. You know, because they were working on the movie while we were working on the game. Yeah. And they were making edits up until the end of April for a game that we had to ship uh, 555, so in May. And again, remember those things I talked about, carts and all that fun stuff? Well, these were discs, but they still needed lead time. And unlike Electronic Arts, LucasArts, oddly enough, did not have the kind of pull that Electronic Arts had. So mm -hmm. Electronic Arts could compress the time of manufacturing certain things because they had they had that kind of cachet. LucasArts did not, so we had to be done in March uh, to ship in May. While they were still working on the movie, they were actually uh, redesigning things, cutting things, all that fun stuff. So, generally speaking with IP, it's the IP holder. That's, mm -hmm. that's the person that's gonna, that, that, and unless, unless it's just you and your team, and then you have to evaluate that. But you know, those are the those are the guys that uh, you you have to constantly have a relationship with them. You have to constantly be feeding them and getting stuff from them. Uh, the in in in, well, in the case of Star Wars, um, they had uh, areas that were in the movie. They knew they were going to be in the movie, but they didn't know what they were going to be. Um, and uh, we were like, what, what? And they said, well, George hasn't signed off on this or that. And I said, okay, so, uh, what's this planet going to look like? Well, we don't know. It, it's probably going to have some sort of fungus or something somewhere. <laughs> and so I said, we, we can't do this. We, it takes us months to generate this stuff that you, know, you guys are going to throw an army of people at and have done. We, we, we can't do that. So I tell you what, based upon the architecture that you have, we extrapolate that this will probably look like this. Mm -hmm. And they were like, oh, wow, yeah, yeah, that seems good. <laughs> and we're like, oh, okay, cool, that seems good. Uh, we're gonna execute this, right? And they're like, yeah, okay, go ahead. And at that point, I'm just like, ah, kind of sucks. Because, you know, you play a lot of these games and you always wonder, why did this person make this off-brand discount version of something? It's because they didn't get from the license or, you know, what they needed in time. And so I'm thinking to myself, oh, crap, we're going to have, like, an entire planet that doesn't look anything like it is in a movie. And this, 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 yeah. So here's the funny part. They started going, hey, so what do you think of this and what do you think of that? And so we would feed them... Um, designs for things. And then, like I said, when I finally went and saw the movie, I was like, oh, that's yeah. us. Like, they, they started taking our designs for stuff. Um, and they called it the expanded universe. Yeah, <laughs> flushed down the toilet. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, you, you have to build the relationship where um, they're not afraid of what you're doing so that you can do what you need to do. And that's been on every single IP I've made. Like, every single licensed game that I've ever worked on is um, the heart and the soul of the license is there, you know? So every fan is like, yeah, that, that's, that's what Buffy's like. Uh, but if you look at it, it's really probably about 50% or so, maybe a little more, that isn't... Um, in the show or the movie or whatever. We made it up. And, but it fits because we understand the universe, you know? And because we have that relationship with the, uh, with the licensor, then they go, oh yeah, that's really cool. If I had had the money, I would have totally made the, the, the merman look like that, but I didn't, thanks. Excellent, thank you, yeah. thank you very much. I think we have time for one more question. Anybody, last question? Throughout your talk, uh, one thing that really stuck out to me was um, how long 
you've been working in the game industry and how many uh, different people you've interacted with and how many different projects you've worked on up until this point. And so one thing that was um, really a big question for me or something that I kind of wanted to ask you was um, uh, what in, in maybe like the next 10 years or however long it takes, what, what might be something that you'd like to see um, f in the future uh, like in the game development industry, like what's maybe some kind of change that you might find really interesting in the next maybe 10 years or something like that? Interesting. Um, I don't know if I will do it, cause, but I will be working for the next 20 years, trust me. Uh, <laughs> but I, I, I'd like to see um, new genres and I know a lot of people say that uh, but I always feel like when they say it they're like raw innovation I hate you um, triple-a blah blah um, I'm not really I, I'm not not downing anyone who wants to crank out the next iteration of something that's beautiful and all that um, but uh, our our medium is the only one of its kind, you know. So right now I feel like we're in a rut as far as um, like genres go. You know, I, I'd like to see some people, someone somewhere generate a genre that everyone, you know, everyone will flock to it and they will make a million clones of it and that's fine, you know. But I want to see more of that. Uh, I want to see People, some, I, I'm old, so I remember seeing Space Invaders to Galaxian to you know Centipede to you know Ikaruga. I mean, I want to see what's someone take take a genre or come up with a genre you know that doesn't exist, so to speak, and what is it? What's the next version of that? You know. Um, not just a polished version of it, but what what's the next thing that that people go holy crap? And most of these things that that actually are are like that um, are what I call forehead slappers, because you know everyone's sitting there. Oh, they're thinking so hard. Oh, how can I be so artsy? Oh my God, how do I do this? And then someone comes along and they do something, and everybody likes it, and you're just like. Of course, of course, it sh of course it should have done that, yeah. But right now, it, it feels a little like this, like we're kind of settling. Maybe it's people waiting for the next generation to come out. I, mean, I don't know. So the answer is just be brilliant. Be brilliant. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> I guess. All right. So my my fi I always get I get the final question. Final question is what is next for Tony Barnes? But I, uh, you know, earlier I tweeted, I, I've, um, I've made uh, a <laughs> lot of money for you a lot and of me people. both, my yeah, friend. I know. Um, maybe it's time that I start doing that for myself. And it's not just about money, because I mean, I talk a lot about finances and stuff here, but it's the engine, you know? I mean, if we don't, if we don't have money to keep the lights on, you know, or to be able to type into our Google search, then we can't actually do it. Um, but yeah, I, I'd like to get back to kind of where I started doing it, you know. So all you uh, need are myself. a dozen computers in a room and every day you just make something new for those computers, right? <laughs> Maybe not that. You know, it's, it's crazy because I, you know, I hit, I hit these little milestones, you know, and I keep telling myself I'm going to remake one of my old games. It's insane. The one of the first games I sold, eight hours. I did it start to finish. I sold it, um, and I got this check for like you know two and a half grand in 1985, wow. right? And I didn't have a bank account. <laughs> I go to my mother and I say, "Here's a check. Um, can you cash it?" She's like, "What is this? Where'd you get this?" And uh, you know, it. It, it's crazy because I, you know, I made, made games, game jam style, um, really fast, and 
now I sit and, and I'm so stuck in my own head of, you know, industry stuff that when I sit and go, oh, I want to remake my game, I can't sit and make it in two days. Right. Even though I have more tools and more knowledge, it would, it would take me, you know, two months to make something that took me two days. Well, because you're, you've calibrated your expectations. Yeah. Right. But I'd like to, I'd like to kind of, you know, reel it in, take it back, get a little more personal, because I've done lots of stuff for lots of other people, and collaboration's great. Uh, you, you often find yourself rubbing up against um, the uh, desires of someone else, and so, um, yeah, I'd like to do something that's kind of personal, I guess to say. Awesome. See that? That's me. I look forward to playing it. We'll All right, see. let's have a big hand for our Master of Game Design, Mr. Tony Barnes. Thank you very much. Yes. All righty, awesome. uh, that's it. Um, thank you all for coming. Uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, I hope to see you all at our Make and Mingle on November 7th. Uh, we will be announcing our next Masters of Game Design uh, for November shortly, so keep your eyes peeled to the NIFA website or to meetup groups, and we hope to see you all back here soon. So thank you very much. Have a great night. Drive safe. Folks.